Collins. She has given several interesting talks here over the past several years. Her passion is in astrobiology. Martians, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight she's going to talk to us about a, an often overlooked phenomenon in astronomy, which is the contributions of a lot of women to astronomy. The only reason we landed on the moon is women did the calculations. Guys would have missed the moon totally. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't, right? right. <laughs> One didn't want to do that. So she's probably going to talk for 45 minutes to 60 minutes. She likes questions either during the talk or at the end. What do you prefer? Anytime. Anytime is fine, she said. So you can ask questions whenever it strikes you to ask a question. Um, and afterwards, we'll open up the telescopes again. It looks like a very clear night, so it should be wonderful observing. Hopefully everybody is dressed for cold, but it'll get cold here as well. Did you get all mic'd up and everything? Yeah. She's ready. Okay. Anyway, this is Emily. Yeah. Alright, is the microphone good? I think so. Excellent. Is, is it on? on? Uh, yes. Did it use the outlet? No. Okay. And it's not on you. Alright, I can. Alright. It's not very loud. It's not on you. It's not loud. It's too loud earlier. I'll just keep talking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I'm the Astro Astrophysics Lab Director. It started with sort of a growing frustration as an educator that the standard astronomy textbooks, you know, you start in ancient Greece and you have Aristotle and then you go to Copernicus and maybe Galileo and Hubble and, you know, two-thirds of the way through the semester, it seems like women had nothing to do with astronomy. So I started compiling a list of women that everybody should know, and this talk really just has some of the top of the list that any astronomer should definitely know about. Um, and I called it a race from history um, because really, in some of these cases, uh, everybody knows what the contribution of the women are, but they didn't get credit for it. In other cases, just because of the time, the women didn't, like, they didn't, no one knew they had anything. So anyway, let's get started. So how many of you saw hidden figures? Excellent. So uh, NASA wasn't the only place employing people to act as computers before we had these fancy mechanical things. Um, here is a picture of the Harvard computers. So in um, the late 1800s, early 1900s, this fellow, Edward Pickering, was the director of the Harvard Observatory. And there was a, another fellow named Henry Draper, who was sort of a pioneer in stellar spectroscopy. And when he passed away, he gave sort of all of his money to the observatory to continue that work, to study stars and try to classify them and separate them into different categories. Well, uh, Pickering used that money and he hired a bunch of women to be his computers. They were sometimes referred to as Pickering's harem. <laughs> anyway, um, but he basically hired them to do all the work. Now what's fascinating is that at the time, of course, women were certainly not allowed to be students and they most definitely were not hired as professors at Harvard. Um, their daily wage was 25 cents. And my first thought was, well, it was 1900s, so maybe that is more or is worth more. So I looked up for inflation. That's roughly like maybe eight dollars a day. Um, but what's also interesting about that is that was about half of what the men made. Um, it was also less than the secretaries made in the department. So doing the science, I guess they didn't value that in terms of money. Now, 
Of these computers, there actually were quite a few who made really important discoveries. This is the one that I was so proud of myself. I don't know if you know my predecessor at CSU, Roger Culver. This is one he didn't even know, and he's Mr. Professional Astronomer. Really? Yeah. And you know, honestly, I didn't know about this until about a year ago, because I was teaching an astronomy course for physics majors, and we were talking about spectroscopy, and this is one of the people that still, if you Google her discovery, probably half of the sites tell you Pickering found it. <coughs> um, so Antonia Mari, I think she was actually a niece of Henry Baker. And she was tasked, along with all of the other computers, with looking at the spectra of stars. And she happened upon a spectrum from Mizar A. Now, I'm sure you've probably seen, if you've gotten to use this observatory before, um, in the Big Dipper, there is what appears to be a binary system, Mizar and Alcor. And if you look at those um, with an actual telescope, you can see that what looks like just one dot with your eye is actually two. So there's Mizar A and B, and then Alcor is quite far apart. But it turns out that Alcor is itself binary, and Mizar A and B are each themselves binaries. But they're so close that you can't tell that there's two separate stars there. Now, just in the normal course of her work, Antonia looked at this spectrum from Zeta Ursa Majoris, so Mizar A. Um, what spectra do, it's like you take a prism. You know how if you hold a prism up to sunlight, it splits all that light into the colors of the rainbow? So that's ultimately what we're doing with starlight here. And when you look at stars, they have certain wavelengths of light that are missing from that rainbow spectrum um, due to the different elements that are in the atmosphere. Now, I tried to stretch this as much as my computer would allow so that you could see this maybe a little bit more clearly. These are just markers to show you what line we're looking at. This is a particular uh, absorption line in the spectrum. And here's that same absorption line just a little bit later. Um, let's see, so this is basically March 29th versus April 5th. And you can see from, if you look, actually, if the little ones even want to come up really close, um, what looks like just one line in the bottom picture actually splits into two lines in the top picture. So what's going on is you have two stars that are so close that your eyeball can't tell them apart, but they are orbiting each other, and as one moves towards Earth, it's like, looks a little bit bluer, and as one moves away from Earth, its light looks a little bit redder. And so in this part of the motion, you see those two separate lines, and then in this part of the motion, uh, when they're moving sideways compared to Earth, those lines overlap. Um, she, her discovery was published and presented at professional conferences, but the paper said Edward Pickering's discovery, and a little footnote that Antonia Mari was consulted on this. Um, she actually left Harvard because she was upset that her work wasn't being recognized. And she was recruited to come back years later with the stipulation that she got to put her name on her own work. Okay, so Annie Jump Cannon is probably the famous of the, most famous of the computers. Um, she was prolific at classifying stellar spectra. So here's a picture of the spectrum, that rainbow, from the very hottest stars down to the very coldest stars. And you can see that you see the full rainbow, but there's some lines that are a little bit different depending upon the type of star you have. Now, the job of the computers was to take these hundreds of thousands of spectra and try and sort them into different bins so that they could try and figure out, OK, how many star types are there? Can we figure out why they have different spectra signatures? Um, they originally, because they had no idea what was causing these lines, they thought, well, let's just split them into categories. And if you look right here, these dark lines that show up in a lot of the spectra, these are due to hydrogen. And they were very well known. So they thought, let's sort these into categories based on how strong that hydrogen line is. And the stars with the very strongest hydrogen line got called A stars a little bit weaker B stars, a little bit weaker C stars, 
they ended up with an original classification scheme of 17 categories, so A through Q, where Q had absolutely no hydrogen lines. Now, Annie Jump Cannon is credited with classifying over 300,000 of the spectra herself. She just became so good at it, she could look at it and, you know, put it in its category. And she went through so many of them that she realized that 17 categories was unnecessary. She could simplify them into seven. These are the letters that were left of that alphabet. She also realized that there was a natural progression, that it didn't make sense to put them alphabetical, but that if you start with the O's, which have weak, or basically the hydrogen lines are missing, that you then go into growing hydrogen lines, and then they disappear, and you get this whole forest in the M-type star. Now, it's actually Cecilia Payne who figured out where those lines come from in the spectrum. She wasn't a computer. She was recruited by Pickering's successor, um, Shapley, who asked her to come specifically to be a PhD student. So not only did she get the first um, PhD at the observatory, but she was also the first um, chair, female chair of any department at Harvard. Um, when she was studying these different spectra, before her work, it was thought that stars with different spectral types, that O versus B versus K, were completely different compositions. So we know that hydrogen produces certain um, lines in the spectrum, and calcium produces certain lines, and iron produces certain lines. So it was thought at the time that stars were much sim more similar to planets, like you have, um, you know, an iron star versus a magnesium star. Well, she realized through her calculations, um, she was using uh, this sort of new baby field of quantum mechanics to calculate how strong these spectral lines would be. And she realized that stars are made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. And it's only trace amounts of some of this other material that creates those lines in the spectrum. Um, let me talk about the lines really quick. So um, the A-type stars, they have a surface temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin. They have very strong hydrogen absorption lines. If you make a hotter star, like the O-type, the biggest type of stars, they're actually so hot that the hydrogen becomes completely ionized. So where these lines come from, you have an electron, it absorbs some energy, it moves to another orbit, but if you've already ripped the electron off, it can't absorb anything anymore. So that's why the lines disappear for O-stars. When you look at the coldest stars, the M-type, they have a surface temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin, they start to become cold enough that stable molecules are present, like titanium oxide, and molecules have a whole forest of lines. Um, in her PhD, she got this result that stars are made mostly of hydrogen and helium, and she presented it to Shapley, and he said, eh, I don't really believe you. He sent off her work to Russell of the famous Hertzsprung-Russell diagram fame, and he didn't really believe her work either. So when she published her work, she said, I got these results. I don't think they're right, but you know, everyone else look at it, see what you can think. And within just a couple of years, Russell and everybody else agreed that she actually had been correct. So she finally um, got that credit. Um, it's been said that she wrote the most important PhD thesis in all of astronomy because she really figured out what the universe is made of. Okay, so this is a talk about women, but the men show up too. Um, well, they show up uh, with a problem, actually, that a woman solves for them. <laughs> so, I mentioned Shapley. Uh, about a year before he took over from Pickering, he participated in this great debate. Believe it or not, in 1920, we still didn't know how big the universe was. So, there were two competing arguments. One was that the Milky Way is the entire universe, and the other argument was that the Milky Way is just an island universe, and there are other island universes, basically we now call them just galaxies. Um, so they held this great debate at the Smithsonian. Shapley 
uh, took the position that the Milky Way had to be the entire universe, and his main piece of evidence was a supernova that happened in 1885. Now, supernova are when a really big star explodes at the end of its life, and it's ridiculously bright. Um, when a supernova occurs in a galaxy, it outshines the entire galaxy for a little bit. Um, we have historical records that when a supernova goes off in the Milky Way, it looks like a star showed up in the sky, and you can see it for a couple of weeks during the day. Like, this is how bright these are. Now, at the time, they didn't know supernova were a thing. They thought it was just a normal nova, just the brightening of something. And so the argument was, we saw this supernova occur. It was ridiculously bright. Something that bright could not possibly be far away. Because if you think about it, take a light bulb, put it three miles away, it's pretty dim. So it couldn't be really far and really bright. Um, Curtis, who was at Lick Observatory, took the opposite position in the bait. Now, they had actually at that time seen other galaxies. They just didn't know it. Um, for example, uh, M31, or the Andromeda Galaxy, is the nearest big galaxy to the Milky Way. Uh, it is far enough that by eye it just looks like a fuzz. Even in the photography of the time, it looked like a spiral fuzz. <coughs> so they were known as spiral nebula. Um, Curtis said, well, when we look at Andromeda, there are a lot of nova occurring in that particular nebula. And his argument was, nova should happen randomly. If they are evenly, you know, if, they, if the Milky Way is the entire universe, then we should see nova in all different regions of the sky. But the fact that we see so many nova confined to this one spot in the sky, Maybe that's because it is spread out across an entire galaxy, but that entire galaxy is so far away that it looks like a small little patch. They didn't actually settle the debate at that point, because really the only way to settle the debate is to measure how far is Andromeda. In steps Hubble, who is known for many things, including discovering that the universe is expanding. Um, he was very interested in galactic astronomy. And he started studying Andromeda. This is a particular star called a Cepheid variable. And if you look at this picture we've got from December 17th up to January 26th, you can see that it gets noticeably brighter. Um, he went to study Andromeda up at the 100 inch at Mount Wilson. And he was measuring how quickly these stars in Andromeda are getting brighter and dimmer. And the reason he did that is because of some work by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She too was a Harvard computer. She was studying these Cepheids and she realized that the time it takes for them to get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer has to do with their overall size. So the very biggest Cepheids pulse pretty slowly, and the smallest stuff is pulse pretty quickly. And you could use these as what we call a standard candle. Uh, if I tell you that you're looking at a 60 watt light bulb, and you say, oh, it's really bright, or oh, it's really dim, you can figure out exactly how far it is, because you know how much energy it's producing. So you can look at the pulsing of the stuff determine how bright it's supposed to be, and then use how bright it appears on the sky to calculate the distance. Um, so anyway, Hubble, he took this relationship that Swan Lovett had found and calculated a distance out to Andromeda, and he got a million light years. We now know it's more like two million, two and a half million light years away. It turns out there's two types of stuff you variable, and he used the wrong one. But still, for Andromeda to be at least a million light years away, um, actually Shapley is responsible for figuring out that the Milky Way itself is only 100,000 light years across. So that finally proved that Andromeda had to be outside of our galaxy. Okay, so we move a little bit, a little bit more modern into the 60s. Um, Jocelyn Bell. So this is sort of the section of my talk 
where we discuss people who didn't win the Nobel Prize and should have. Here's a picture of her as a graduate student. She was a radio astronomer, and she was sitting at the observatory one day, just observing the source, and she realized that this source was pulsing, and that this type of object actually became known as pulsars. Um, at first, as a joke, she wrote LGM for little green men, like maybe these are aliens. <laughs> But they realized that the pulsing was too perfect and too regular to be some artificial signal. Um, it was finally determined what these pulsars were. This was the first observational proof of something called a neutron star. So when stars go supernova, their cores collapse into a big ball of neutrons. And even though it's a relatively hot object, a neutron star is like maybe as big as Fort Collins. So when you take something that small and put it far away, you can't take a photograph of it. It's very difficult. Now, these had been theorized up to this point, but no one had found proof that they exist. But what we realized was that a pulsar is just a special type of neutron star. When these things collapse, you really strengthen their magnetic field. And if their magnetic field is not aligned with their rotation, you end up getting this pulsing because radiation likes to stream out from the poles of the magnetic field. But if radiation is streaming this way and you're rotating this way, it acts like a lighthouse and it just blinks on and off. Um, let's see, now they knew that this had to be a neutron star instead of something else like a light dwarf because some of these pulsars are millisecond pulsars. So they blink on and off a thousand times every second. And when you calculate the rate that that star would have to spin at to blink that quickly, um, it's faster than the escape velocity of a white dwarf. Imagine you take a white dwarf, you spin it that quickly, it would just fly apart. So these had to be neutron stars. Now the story here is because she was a graduate student, and this is still mostly the case today, when you write a paper as a graduate student to publish it, your advisor is first author and your advisor gets credit for the publication, and you just contributed to it. So, um, Pulsars actually did win the Nobel Prize in Physics. But it didn't go to her, it went to her boss, who will remain nameless. <laughs> I, think she, I think he shared it that year too. But you know, that's a half million dollars she didn't get. Now she is a very humble and gracious woman because if you ask her about it, she'd say, well, that's just how it is. He's the advisor. He's the first. You know, I'm, I'm not upset. It's OK. Part of that's probably because astronomers know it was really her. So there's that. She did actually uh, relatively recently, I want to say in the last couple of years, win the Breakthrough Prize in Physics, which was $3 million. <laughs> so that, that helps my psyche anyway. But she's still such a humble person. She didn't keep it. She immediately donated it. So. Okay, and that brings us to Vera Rubin. So Vera Rubin discovered this material that we call dark matter. Um, when we look out at galaxies and we see stars and we see dust and we see gas, we see them because they're producing more in case of dust blocking light. Um, Vera Rubin was studying spiral galaxies. In particular, she was looking first at Andromeda. And she started making these rotation curves. Now, a rotation curve is just plotting how fast does something move versus how far is it from the center of the system. And when you look at something like the solar system, where almost all of the mass is inside the sun, and you just have planets orbiting, uh, that rotation curve drops off really fast. Now, in a galaxy, we don't expect the rotation curve to drop off that swiftly, but it should eventually drop, we would think, because as you get farther away from the center, the um, gravity depends upon the distance between objects. So if you're getting twice as far away, all other things being equal, gravity should drop by a factor of four. Now, gravity is what keeps these things in their orbit around the Milky Way. Um, 
I like to think of this as when I was in kindergarten, we used to play this game. Five of us would line up and we'd hold hands and we'd spin, right? Because that's fun. And we'd all try to spin at the same rate. And you can imagine when we're doing that, the poor sap at the end, <laughs> you know, they pretty quickly, they just fly off the end because your little kindergarten hands aren't strong enough to keep them attached when they're rotating that quickly. So with a galaxy, gravity can only be so strong, we expect that stars moving too fast would fly off and not be in the galaxy anymore. It turns out that for most spiral galaxies, this rotation curve is flat, or even in some cases, increasing. And the only way to do that is to have extra oomph, extra pull, to keep those really fast moving stars at the edge attached. So it's like we take all our kindergartners, we tie their hands with ropes so they can't fly off, and now we've got that extra strength and now we can spin super fast. So the thinking is, okay, gravity is what keeps things in orbit, so if something's moving too fast and still in orbit, there must be more gravity. This is what we'd expect just from the amount of matter that we see visibly, so stars, gas, dust. This extra flat piece of the light curve, there must be something else exerting gravity, but not emitting light. And so that's where we get this concept of dark matter, which has gravity, can pull on things, but isn't visible. Um, we think now that 90% of the mass of our galaxy is actually this dark matter. And the dark matter halo is 10 times wider than the visible part of the disk. So dark matter actually is most of the matter in the universe. And this is another case where Everybody agrees that dark matter is worthy of a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, Vera passed away um, before anyone had the smarts to give it to her, so she didn't get to get a Nobel. But this is one situation where the recognition has also been delayed, but finally came. Um, there's this observatory in Chile that used to be called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. What it's doing is it's scanning the entire sky that it can see once every three days or something. And the goal is to look for transient events. So if you just, you know, blink a year's worth of images, can you discover supernova? Can you discover exoplanets? Can you discover asteroids in our solar system? Um, Congress finally did something. Yay! <laughs> The only thing they've managed to accomplish recently is they passed a resolution to rename this the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And it's the first U.S. observatory named after a woman. So that's pretty impressive. And I just love, love this picture. Here she is in her office. She's such a boss. She gets to stand on the desk. <laughs> okay. And so I want to wrap up here by talking about a couple of women who became viral recently, for all the wrong reasons. We start with Margaret Hamilton. Um, I don't know how many of you know, last year was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. We would not have landed on the moon had it not been for Margaret Hamilton. She was a software engineer. She was working at MIT. She actually coined the term software engineer and got some flack from her male colleagues for it. They said she was trying to um, make what she did sound more important than it really was. This is her standing next to the source code she wrote for the Apollo Guidance Program. So this is how they landed that on the moon. It turns out that what happened, these silly astronauts, they did something wrong in their checklist of like buttons to push when they were landing. And the hardware said, oh no, error, error, abort mission. The purpose of this software was to be able to sort of think and look at all the processes and say, this is important, this doesn't matter, ignore this, and keep going. So her software is what rescued them from their own incompetence and allowed them to land on the moon. <laughs> now this, this is always impressive that, you know, that code is as tall as she was. What I think is also hilarious is that, you know, in your back pocket, or I guess not in my back pocket right now, I'll have to find that later, 
Um, phones nowadays easily will have 64 gigs of storage. The Apollo astronauts had 72 kilobytes of memory that they could use. And so, you know, they really had to crank to figure out what they could do. Now, she came to everybody's attention because of the PR department at MIT. Actually, also, well, it should have come to attention because of the Apollo anniversary. But someone at MIT made her go viral because of this event. So last year, you probably saw in the news the first image of a black hole, which is such a big no. You can't see a black hole, that's the point. <laughs> the first image of the accretion disk around a black hole. So when material falls in, it doesn't fall straight in. It gets stuck in orbit and it spirals in. And this disk gets so hot that it starts to glow. Now the accretion disk of a black hole is still smaller than a, a solar system. So this is such a small object that it's very hard to take an image of. There is this collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope. It's not really a single telescope, but a bunch of telescopes across the world that use a technique called interferometry to get as sharp an image as possible as if we built a telescope as big as the Earth. Now, in this case, what's fascinating, to make this image, they had to collect so much data. This is Katie sitting with all of the hard drives they collected. They had so much data, it would have been too slow to send it over the internet. So they put it on all of these hard drives and flew it to, once again, MIT and the other locations processing it. And then they took their computer algorithms to reconstruct that photograph from the data. So she came to sort of national attention. MIT wanted to promote one of their scientists. They published this photograph with this photograph and said, look at these MIT women and all of the great stuff they do. And it, it should have been a great post, right? Everyone should have been like, yay, good job. Well, no, there's trolls out there. So this image got posted later. So what she was responsible for she was the lead on one of the teams writing the software to produce the image from all of the data. And what they eventually did is, like, I want to say three separate teams or something, made their own version of the image, and then they combined it to produce what was published. So this photograph is her sitting basically at her computer watching this picture as it's being constructed. And the trolls went to town, they said, you know, science doesn't work that way. People work on teams. She didn't do it by herself, which, you know, obvious. Why we need to say that except to try and discredit her. A bunch of other people said, oh, that guy in the background really did it. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, the, the, the troll, the heat from the trolls was just so much. They got so upset that, like, he's publicly apologizing, like, no, 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 she really was the lead of the team. Like, I'm just sitting in the background of the picture. Well, you know, all, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so anyway, I just bring this up because one of the questions I get asked a lot and one of the questions that I ask other people a lot is that astronomy and particularly physics is still very much dominated by men. And so the question is, how do we combat that? How do we draw more women? How do we draw more people of color? Because um, they're really a rarity. In astronomy. Um, and it's like, well, even if you can recruit them, the trolls, man, they're just trying to drive you away and make you not want to do science anymore. At the very least, I think that um, incidents like this let the people who know what's going on celebrate the accomplishments of women instead of forgetting them to history. Anyway, so I think I will leave it there. And if you have any questions, I'd like to try and answer those. Can you explain a little bit more about the Synoptic Telescope, what it does, how it operates? Um, well, what do you mean? I mean, it, it literally is just automatic. So most telescopes, you have to uh, propose for time. I want to look at this particular object. 90% of the time on this telescope is just scanning the sky and getting a picture of the entire thing. 
Um, this telescope is also pretty unique. Most telescopes, I don't know, people are pretty stingy with their data. They want to win the Nobel Prize and not someone else. So you get to keep your data for six months to a year before it gets made public. But for this telescope, the data goes live um, free for anyone in the US or Chile just immediately. And so anyone who's looking for a job in the near future should go into computer science because they're looking for people who can take big data and just crunch it out and compare the pictures and see what they can um, discover that we can follow up on with other telescopes. Yeah. Uh, when you were saying the, the measuring of the hydrogen mm -hmm. on the star, what, what was it that the, the light from the star is being exposed, or is it like film strips, or what, what was that? Um, yeah, so back then they were still using just photographic plates, so kind of like, like, like film, but plates of glass that were exposed. Um, so the idea is the light goes into a prism or a diffraction grating and spreads it into the rainbow, and then you're just taking a photograph of that rainbow. Yeah. I think most people didn't think it was the fellow in the background. There's just some people in this world who are professional trolls and who like to post things that are just mean. So they decided to pick up on this guy, probably just because he's a fellow, and say he must have done everything and the women aren't smart enough to do it. <laughs> the, the problem is, even though there's very few mean people like that, they're the loudest, and so they drown out the people who know what's really going on. Yeah. So out of Pickering's computer. Yes. <laughs> were there any male in there? I mean, uh, we no. saw they're all women, and <laughs> no, and you know, uh, I don't know if that's just creepy dude hiring women <laughs> or cheap labor. I mean, seriously, you'd have to pay men twice as much to do this, so it's easier to just hire the women. <laughs> And also, you get to take credit for their work. <laughs> yes? I'd like to see more presentations like this with the recommendation of commending women for their what they've achieved in PC. I think that there's um, a large, a vast uh, lack of knowledge of what women have done in this area. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know how you get this out, but... Right. Well, actually, so it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, I, before making this talk last year, I realized that March is Women's History Month, and I thought, there's got to be at least 31 women, right, that I can highlight on Twitter. Ugh, I hate Twitter, but that's, that's <laughs> And I stopped when I got to, like, 150. I'm like, that's more than a month, so I'm okay. Um, but just a couple days ago, I got a a newsletter from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. No, I don't think it was them. I think it was my uh, open stack. So the fellow who is in, who sort of runs the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, he also writes this online free textbook. Um, and they sent out a newsletter that had a bunch of resources um, for like the history of women. So actually, maybe we could post that somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other place that's really lacking, and it just kills me, I mean, here's a bunch of lovely women who have done things, and they're all white women. So that's the next piece that really I think we need to focus on, too. From an academic perspective, is there any effort to start rectifying standard textbooks so we're not having to look at supplementary material for our kids to learn about these people? Um, I mean, I think we're just starting to recognize that there's a problem, and so we're trying to address it. Um, I think part of the issue, too, is that we're very, like, Eurocentric. I mean, it's, it's like science started with Greek, and that, you know, forget everyone in China, forget everyone in India, forget anyone anywhere else. So, um, yeah, I think if we can just sort of push the people writing the textbooks to focus on more of a global perspective, 
not really know. Um, uh, as a grandmother, mm -hmm. I, uh, one of my granddaughters loved math in fourth grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Now, as a seventh grader, she's decided she's interested in language arts and English. And I'm so disappointed. It's, you know, I, the, the anger part of me wants to go to that school and say, what did you do to her? Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that's fair either. Any clues as to where that goes and how that gets lost? Um, I think it really is um, just sort of a stereotype bias. I mean, there's a lot in our culture that says women can do these things and men can do these things, and there gets to be a point. Um, there's been some really interesting work done where um, folks are given just a standardized test, and literally, if you ask someone beforehand to identify their demographics, male, female, race, ethnicity, all that kind of stuff, then you see a much bigger disconnect between like the white males and everyone else than if you don't get them thinking about that before they take the test. There's sort of this ingrained like, oh, I'm this person, so I shouldn't be good at math, and it just, it kind of tanks your confidence as you go through. Yeah? I have one more personal question. What, what brought you, like, were you always into astronomy, or how did you kind of follow that? So, two answers. Um, one, I think I, I, I kind of had no choice because my dad liked science. Well, he was a scientist. He always liked astronomy. He said he would have done it if he could have done math. Um, I, so when people ask me this question, I have two answers, really. One, in kindergarten, they bought, brought one of those blow-up planetariums to school. Yeah. Do you have one of those? No, the school gets one every year. Ah, excellent. Yes. Those are very important. Also, my dad was a huge Star Trek nerd, so I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. <laughs> Anyone seen the new Picard? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. The first thing to get me to pay for TV, Picard. Anyway, yeah, so I, I guess I just call it, always kind of like it. And as well, so I guess there's a second influence. My mom was very much women can do anything, and women can be good at science and math, and so I was always on like this, this trajectory of take the highest math possible, because no one thinks I can do it. Um, do astronomy, because no one thinks I can do it. I grew up in Idaho, people were pretty shocked that anyone would want to be an astronomer. <laughs> and then when I got to college, I had professors who literally said, you need to quit astronomy, and that's the wrong thing to tell me, because that's going to make me do it more. So. I guess that kind of reinforces it for me. Are you going to stay uh, after a little bit? Yeah, you can stick around a little bit if you have some more questions. Let's um, give her a round of applause.